Hi, so my name is Tesney Ward. I am the Olympus Wildlife Ambassador here in the UK and I have been using the system for around about four and a half years now. So when I initially changed system, I'd always been very eager to sort of dabble and try video and obviously moving footage. But it was very, very difficult for me having a large DSLR system to actually make this an achievable goal. When I moved, all of a sudden, it was a lot more accessible to me. And again, over the past around about three to four years now, I've been having a hell of a lot of fun experimenting with this new style of footage. So it was, very, it was a very difficult learning curve initially because some of the things that we are most used to when doing stills don't apply when it comes to photography. And also because I am a photographer, it can be very difficult to justify taking time out to do footage when there are great opportunities for stills as well. So over the time I have dabbled as best possible with this different approach. It's been fantastic, but stills are always my priority. So often when really exciting things are happening, the video gets turned off and I start taking stills. And in the long run, this means it's going to take a lot of time to be able to build a portfolio of footage and moving images. I have to have the still in the bag first. Now, when it comes to uh, video, again, as I've mentioned, there are a lot of differences between stills and video. And one of the ones that I found quite difficult to get my head around was things to do with the frame rate and your shutter speed. So when it comes to stills, you're used to wanting a slightly faster shutter speed to be able to freeze the footage. But when it comes to video, it's a little bit different. So what they usually recommend is they want your shutter speed to be double your frame rate. And whilst this seems in principle that it wouldn't work, the actual footage that you get from it looks a lot more natural. But that means it's also difficult to actually capture footage when you have variable light conditions. So if it's very cloudy, for example, a windy day and that cloud is getting pushed over, if it's going from bright to dark to bright, it's very, very challenging to be able to balance out your exposure and get good footage. So I'm usually waiting for very standard neutral lighting. I don't want it to be variable and changeable because that's going to make it extremely difficult for me to be able to capture footage. On top of this, it's also been a big learning curve when it comes to the lenses. So when it comes to sort of the top of the range video and cameras, they use video specific lenses. So a lot of it is in manual focus and with a video specific lens, the slightest movement doesn't knock it out. So you have to do quite large movements to move the focus. Whereas when it comes to a photography lens, the slightest movement can make a huge difference. So when I'm trying to capture footage of an erratic subject, for example, it can be really, really difficult to hold the focus throughout the clip. And upgrading the system, so now I use the EM1X, the autofocus is significantly better in video. So I find that if I'm doing something like flying birds, I can rely on the autofocus a lot better and I don't have to worry too much about manually focusing. But if the subject is a little bit more static, I do still opt for manual focus. And I will usually utilize the uh, focus peaking. So I'll have a visual representation of where the focus is in the clip that's live whilst I'm recording. So that really, really helps to keep it locked on and not shift too far mid clip. So one of the things that I absolutely love about the Olympus system when it comes to video is the image stabilization. So with wildlife, often I need to be quite far back using a long lens so that I can capture natural non-disturbed behavior. But one of the challenges with this, and especially historically when I was using a DSLR, was the footage would be so shaky that it was impossible to get the end clip that I wanted. So with the image stabilization, I don't have to worry about it anymore. I don't need to use a tripod. I don't need to be careful using things like a gimbal. 
I can just hand hold and capture my footage. So this also means that it's really, really handy. Again, if I'm moving between stills and video, I have that fluidity to be able to do both. Not worrying about having to set it up on a gimbal or a tripod and get everything ready for the video when in that time I could be missing more stills. So it's been really, really handy to be able to have that flexibility. One of the other things that I really love about capturing footage is if something unexpected happens that's pretty wild and out there, I can just take the still out of that footage. So it's really, really handy on those occasions when, again, I'm filming, something awesome happens, I can just take that still out and use it. Now, usually I won't use it in uh, sort of very, very large prints, but if I'm wanting it for reference, social media, online stuff, the quality is there and it's really refreshing to know that I've not missed an opportunity just because I was filming. One of the other difficulties with video is the post-processing. So when the EM1X launched, Olympus introduced the OM log format. So that means that if you are wanting to do color grading and a lot of processing, you now have the ability to do that. So when you are shooting stills, naturally you want to try and capture as much detail and color as possible. But when you shoot in a RAW, it maintains a lot more detail and you do need to do a little bit more processing. So if you think of log as the video format of RAW, the colors and the contrast is a little bit flatter, but that gives you a lot more flexibility to be able to do your color grading and process that video to really, really pop when you have the end result, which means you have a lot more detail in the highlights and the shadows. So again, when you're processing, you can bring out a lot more detail and it's one of the best in the market currently. For me, I have done a hell of a lot of footage and video with badgers. So these are my absolute top animal in the world. I love them to pieces, but because they're nocturnal, Obviously the light can be a little bit of a challenge and also they live in a woodland. So even if it is, it is a bright evening and the sun is starting to set, a lot of the light still doesn't reach the set. So usually I will be again prioritizing stills when the light is good enough, but I love the fact that when I'm shooting footage, the light can be a lot lower and I can still capture some pretty incredible clips. So often I'm not afraid of bumping my ISO super high and I will sometimes also push the shutter speed quite slow, but it allows me to capture intimate moments with these incredible animals. And even when the light visibly is very, very dark and difficult, I can still keep filming. So often I'm able to capture these really intimate moments where they are grooming, preening, playing, bouncing around the set. And it can be very difficult to show this in a still image. One, because again, the light sucks a little bit and it's very difficult to get the shutter speed fast enough to freeze those super fast action moments. But also when it comes to context, a badger rolling down a hill in a still is probably just going to look like a bundle of fluff. So having the moving footage really helps to complete the picture in terms of what's happening at that site. I absolutely love capturing stills of them, but I found that since I started filming them as well, I find it a lot more enriching and rewarding being able to capture these, foot, these pieces of footage that really do tell the whole story. And you can really pick up on the individual badger's behaviors, their personality, their temperament, and the kind of things that they get up to. So often those really, really cheeky individuals, especially when they're around about six months old, that's when they really do start to shine and you see the differences between the individuals really start to stand out. Again, capturing that footage really, really helps in terms of having an overall story to pull from. So one of my favorite clips of them to date was one particular evening the sun had set quite a while ago, so there were no there were no opportunities for stills at that point. Three badgers were all together grouped up and grooming. 
And obviously badgers, they're waking up in the evening, they're getting ready for their night's antics. But these three badgers, they were around about a year and a half old at the time, all cuddled up, had a little bit of a groom, and then fell asleep on top of one another. Now this is something that's not often seen by the naked eye, let alone captured on footage. So I was absolutely chuffed that it was actually a high resolution clip, not my usual trail camera, and just seeing how relaxed and comfortable they were in their environment to the point where they just fell asleep in a little bundle. So it's a little bit of an insight as to what they do when they're underground but seeing it above ground was so rewarding. And again, it's one of my favorite clips to date with them. So looking back over the past few years when I've been doing stills, I can think of numerous occasions where honestly, I really wish I'd been filming it. So again, because I'm a photographer, I do have to prioritize those stills. And until I have those in the bag, I really can't justify moving over to video. But you see some absolutely incredible things, high action stuff, where you're so busy taking shots. In hindsight, you look back and you think, I really wish I'd filmed this. And probably the most recent one that I can think of was when a badger called Lissa was grooming in the absolute perfect spot. So I was really, really pleased with the evening's result because I was able to capture a portrait of Lissa grooming. She was sat on her backside looking really, really happy. But again, I had to prioritize the stills at the time because it was something I didn't yet have and had been trying for three years to capture. But she was so active, she was stretching her legs out, licking the air from enjoyment. I wish I'd been able to film it as well because it was a very, very special moment. And often when the badgers do this, they'll be grouped up, they'll be behind a bush, behind a tree, a hill. It's very difficult to isolate them. And this was one of the very few occasions when I was able to. But if this happens again, I know I have that still and it will be a lot easier for me to justify flipping over to video and capturing it in action. Often there are challenges that you come across when you are capturing footage. So often when I am filming up in the Highlands in Scotland, the conditions can be pretty nasty. There can be snow drifts, practically blizzards, and whilst again, you can capture awesome stills of this, when it comes to capturing footage, as the snow is building up on the front of the lens, sometimes things physically freeze up, it's very difficult to get a full clip that's not ruined by some of these elements. So often the conditions, there's very little we can do to control them. But again, if I can perceive that there's going to be a problem with the footage for whatever reason, again, I will usually prioritize the stills because I need to maximize my time out in the field. So just like in photography, I learned video through trial and error and I made a hell of a lot of mistakes. So naturally when I started doing it, I was using my DSLR. It was a hell of a long and heavy lens and it was extremely difficult to keep the image and the footage still throughout the entire clip. And that was even when I was using a tripod because I found that the slightest amount of movement or vibration through the tripod did transfer into the actual clip. So it was a very, very steep learning curve. And I have a hell of a lot of clips that I can't use because I've made big mistakes. So things like zooming in mid footage. In hindsight, there are clips that I have ruined because I have zoomed in mid clip. So again, that introduces vibration. The autofocus that I was using at the time went a little bit AWOL and it was really disappointing to see clips that otherwise would have been awesome ruined because I made silly little mistakes. But again, stills and footage are completely different and the principles that you have to follow, again, they are different. It's also things like the manual focus. So in the early days, it was very difficult to make those minute changes. And even the little things like knowing which direction to move the focus ring in to either move forward or backwards. So I learned very quickly, left is long. If I need to focus further back, I will turn the focus ring anti-clockwise and obviously vice versa if I need to move closer in. So the more I practiced and the more I used this, I was able to really fine tune it. 
So the clip I'm about to show is sort of a culmination over the past three to four years. It is very difficult to build a portfolio when video is not your priority. But the more I work with it, the more I get those stills in the bag, the more focus I can put towards video. So you're going to see a variety of clips from all over the world. Usually, again, I'm taking it when I don't see the potential for a photo there. But often that means that there can be good footage available. And I love the ability to work with both. So I hope you enjoy the clip. It's all manual focus, all handheld, and all shot on an Olympus system. Thank you ever so much for attending my online talk today. Obviously TPS with all of the COVID restrictions, it's been a little bit all over the place, but I am so impressed with how they have adapted. And obviously this year it's online for the first time ever. So I hope you enjoy the rest of the show. I hope you enjoyed the talk and I hope you enjoy the rest of your week getting out with your cameras, capturing stills and video.